Hello, my name is Jeremy. This is Red Means Recording, and I'm here on a nasty Sunday afternoon to do a walkthrough of OP1 010520, uh, my city, what I did to it in Ableton. Uh, like I said in the previous uh, one of these Ableton walkthroughs for Tightrope, I'm going to try to do one of these a month. Um, and yeah, a lot of people are like, do you do the whole track in the OP1? And I'm, I'm like, no. I don't know how many times I have to say that. I don't. I do it in Ableton after I do it in the OP1. Um, the OP1's great, but it's not uh, It's not like as good as Ableton. So let's go through what I did to get this track from a disaster of a session to um, something that wasn't terrible. When I did the OP1 session, I was really scattered and I ended up just like losing the plot completely and recording like four or five different unrelated sort of sections. And um, I needed to bring it into Ableton and make sense of it. So what we ended up with is a much more concise sort of focus on what I thought were the strongest elements within the track. In the OP1 recording, I recorded some Foley sounds and I put those in just some, just some background stuff. It's nice to have background stuff. Everything that comes in from the OP1 gets an instance of Supercharger, which is a saturation plugin um, by Native Instruments, saturation and compression. And the reason that I do this, you know, bump up the saturation, give it some compression, give it some character, is because the OP1 has a master um, drive, which is sort of like a master compressor. It has a very, very specific characteristic. It does this really cool gel thing, and I haven't really been able to necessarily reproduce it in post. But one of the ways that I can sort of get to it is by uh, supercharging every single track that comes through. I used to use the Ableton Saturator, which is fine, um, but now I use Supercharger because it gives me some more control. Then I got some noise risers. Nothing really special here. I actually wasn't going to use any risers or crashes but I decided uh, at the very end that just a little light uh, push here and there was nice. Um, when I want my crashes and other things to ring out really far, I use Valhalla Shimmer. You can hear that big tail we have going on there, that big old tail. That's what it sounds like without. Just like, it's just like a really, really nice chamber for things, especially crashes. We got some little tiny percussions in here that come in when the, I realized I haven't played any of the track yet. <laughs> Just some nice little percussions. Um, the, the gist of this track was to go for like a really woozy sort of like, like out of tune, weird, uh, like sort of, I don't even know what the genre would be. I, I had some th uh, thoughts in my head as to like what I was going for. Almost like if Calm Trues made Lo-Fi House, I guess. I don't fucking know. Anyways, let's get to the drums. So um, here's the main drums. We got a breakbeat and we got a four on the floor. These are really simple. Like there's, I only ended up taking two loops from the whole thing. Um, I have an auto filter uh, to use in some cases. I think I use it to bring in the hi-hats at the beginning because they were just a little too bright. I don't know, where do I use this? Do, 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 do. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> okay, that's really weird. Uh, the auto filter is doing nothing. That's cool. Um, the real star of this is the drum bus, which is a, a multi-control uh, drum thing from Ableton. So what we're gonna get out of this is a lot more uh, perceived volume. We are uh, saturating it a little bit and we're taking the, the top end way down to 2.5 kilohertz uh, as opposed to 20 kilohertz, which is the top end. And this gives it a really nice blunted sound, which uh, works really well for the sort of lo-fi wooziness of the track. When um, I want the drums to be there, but not be big, uh, I have a channel EQ, which is just a really basic EQ. Um, and I'm taking out the lows and the highs and um, gives it, giving us a little sort of like lo-fi instance of the beat that can exist to oh my propel the track with rhythm, but not be like big. Okay, cool. So then we have three instances of texture. Um, and texture, you can see it got the same things here. We got a useless auto filter. Is this seriously not doing anything for the whole time? We have the drum bust doing almost the same thing, less dampening um, because this is about adding some high end texture. All of the loops that are in here are the same drum loop that you heard before. 
um, but they are being manipulated by this plugin called Texture, which I talked about in my last uh, Ableton walkthrough. Texture is something that's going to take your incoming audio and apply a new sample to it based on the attack and other characteristics of the incoming audio. So this is actually just like the hi-hats from the original loop, but I'm uh, running it through Texture and it's triggering this male talking thing, which is actually really, really cool because the it's sweeping through like the sample and like making this really weird abstract like percussion instrument out of it. So that's just sitting in the background throughout. You can hear it here. And then um, we have a couple other instances of texture doing come other samples because um, I'm just really in love with texture right now to take the OP1 stuff and turn it into something else without me having to load up a drum rack um, and pick samples. So before, after, that's pretty cool, right? ahead and turn that back on. All right, those are our drums. Uh, the main drums, we have a little break that's running through molecular to give it that crazy phasing. That's just sort of a background texture. And we already talked about the percussion. So those are our drums, 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 to drum, to drums. Uh, let's talk about bass. Oh yeah, this is kind of cool. So um, the original bass was obviously from the OP1. And you can see that I ran it through Supercharger, I ran it through CLO Bass to give it um, some zhuzh, that's what this Chris Lord Algae thing from Waves does. Mm -hmm. And then I had um, I had the compressor doing a sidechain from the, the drum kick. Um, without any of these, it sounds like this. So it's okay, uh, I thought I was gonna use it, but then I was like, I don't like it as much. I need something that actually hits into the uh, mids and highs a little bit because it was just too dubby, too, too bassy, and I couldn't coax anything out of it. Uh, that would put it up into those frequencies. So one of the cool things you can do in Ableton, and I'm gonna go ahead and split this here, is if you right click on a piece of audio, you can convert it to MIDI. Um, and there's, you can see there's like three different types here. So I can convert something that's polyphonic to a harmony tr uh, MIDI track. I convert something that's monophonic to a mel melody MIDI track. And then if um, there are drums, uh, I will it will convert it to a drum rack. So if I click this, it's gonna analyze this little piece of audio and it's going to do its best pitch. Uh, it's going to do its best job at pitch detection and uh, timbre detection to create an instrument rack that um, will play this with uh, with a new instrument. So um, let's go ahead and listen to what it did. Here's the original. So not a bad job um, uh, guessing pitch and timbre. It got some of this stuff wrong and I had to go edit it a little bit, but that's what this bass track is. This is uh, a synthesized bass. What did I use? Uh, Wavetable. This is my favorite thing in the world right now um, to uh, make a new bass. And this gave me finer control over timbre and uh, all that kind of stuff. I could uh, rewrite the bass line and stuff like that, which I actually did in the beginning to introduce the melody. So. Let's see what's going on with this. We have a, uh, a square wave, we have um, an internal wave table, um, and we just have some filter uh, stuff going on. Um, just a little bit of filter envelope. It's running through CLL base, just the default, which gives us uh, a little bit of zhuzh and some wideness, um, no unison mode, and then we are compressing it with a side chain. So really simple, but it, it's a much better base for this track than uh, the previous was. And that's the thing about writing on something like the OP1, like you're gonna be able to get ideas down fast. And I think that's really, really important, but like you may not always wanna use exactly what you did in the OP1. And with the tools that are present in a DAW, um, you can go and rewrite things or change the, the sound of things or anything like that. And I think that's great. Like get your ideas down fast in whatever method you can and then refine them later. At the very end of the OP1 session, I was like desperate for any kind of thing that could be construed a hook. So I had this little vocal sample that I got from OP1.fun, which is an amazing uh, resource of OP1 samples and kits and sounds. Um, and... Love my C. 
it's just this little... My city ain't pretty, but it's mine. My city gold plated my bones. So little bloods don't waste my time. Uh, just this little cool little thing about my city. When I make the, when I remake this track for the, uh, or when I revisit this track for the album cut, I think I'm going to change up the way that this vocal line is presented and maybe add a few more things. I had an idea for this that I wasn't able to execute on before I wanted to get this out. So, um, this may go away, uh, or be transmuted. I went through a shit ton of work trying to get this to fit quite how I wanted it to in the mix. And, um... Oh my it's, it's actually pretty far back in the mix, uh, and it appears a lot. You can see that I have um, rolled off the lows and the highs here. I also tried running it through Nectar, I tried running it through Vocal Synth, and I tried running it through Trash to give it a new timbre, uh, and in the end I just decided to leave it pretty much dry. It just wasn't working. I wanted it to be deeper, I wanted it to be what something that it wasn't, and I was trying too hard to make it something that it wasn't. So I did add an echo just to sort of place it in the space a little bit more. Oh, I see. Pretty simple. So that plays throughout uh, as sort of like the ident of the track. And again, I'm probably gonna swap that out um, for something else. All right, so uh, let's start from the bottom of, uh, no, let's start from the tops of the main group. So the reason that all of these main synths are together like this, is because I wanted to process them all together uh, and make them weirder, make them all a bit hazier and woozier, and also um, give them all a little bit more high-end uh, zhuzh. So I have a instance of ozone um, pushing up, oh, nice, pushing the, uh, the high highs up and uh, compressing the other two bands. Um, the maximizer is giving us a little bit more volume and the EQ is doing absolutely nothing. And then we are running it through an instance of uh, Audio Damage Quattro Mod. Let's see if we can hear what this is doing. Wow, that's really subtle, isn't it? Okay. So it's really hard to hear, but what's basically what's going on is we're getting a little bit of extra wideness, a little bit of gauzy sort of like uh, diffusion on everything. And again, that's just because like I really wanted the vibe of this track to be f sort of woozy and uh, almost warped record-y kind of thing. Not warped records, but like a warped record. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just wanted to process all of these things together to kind of gel them and give them a little bit of that otherworldliness. So if we move into the main sample, um, or what I'm calling the main sample, this was track one off the, uh, mostly track one off the OP1. And um, I am processing this uh, with rolling off some lows. I'm side chaining it. Um, I am using an auto filter. I actually am automating the auto filter this time to bring it in and out. And then um, we are getting an audio damage phase three on it, which adds uh, some phasing. Before. After. Do that, that swimming. That's pretty fucking cool. I got all the audio damage plugins recently. I did not pirate them, Chris. So, you know, you know, we talked. Okay. Uh, sample two is that woozy, uh, almost housey pad. And um, it's also getting instance, it's almost getting the same thing as uh, track one. Um, but I am giving it a little high end boost because I just wanted it to tickle your ears a little bit more. Cool. Vibes are, uh, uh, vibey sounds, um, you know, like marimba's pitch percussion. Um, now these, without all of this lovely shit, sound like this. So the sample inherently has a nice sort of like lo-fi hiss to it, which I really liked. I thought that was cool, but I needed to dumb them down a bit. Not dumb them down, that's the wrong word. I needed to um, to put the vibes a little bit in the background uh, when they were playing within the mix. Um, they felt a little too bright, especially here at the beginning. So we're side chaining them, we are uh, compressing them. No, we're not. We are using the Vintage EQ from uh, Ozone 9 to just roll off a lot of the highs. Um, bloop, bloop, bloop. Then we are uh, setting it to the left because um, instead of using this right here, this pan control, uh, this lets me pan before our reverb. So we get a stereo reverb, but we've panned to the left a bit. So 
it's like you're hearing it in a room to your left and the reverb is filling up the space um, as opposed to having a stereo reverb pan to the left, which is going to be a different vibe. Um, and then, remember how I said warped vinyl? Here is our uh, warped vinyl. Um, this is a free plugin from Isotope. So if you want a good uh, record emulator, this is good. Now, I'm going to stop talking and I want you to listen to, when I turn this on and off, the way that we're going to get some like uh, reduced highs and we're going to get a warble on it, like a, like a, a warped record kind of sound. So uh, off. Very subtle, but I really love it. Uh, and then some echo to place it in the space. Those are our vibes. Um, we had a sort of Rhodes-esque patch, which was an actually OP1 synth patch. And this isn't doing much except being um, uh, sent to some delay and we got an auto filter on it. We're side changing it. It was, a, it was a very good patch, just dry. And those and the vibes work together to give this track its main feel. Really like those two together. All right, next up, we had a little bit of arpeggiating action going on um, near the end and the beginning of the track, and there's really not a lot going on here. We use an auto filter to push things uh, up and down. Um, we're actually just going down. You can see the auto filter is set at 3.15 kilohertz throughout the entire thing. Uh, that's because I wanted to take the highs down from this to add sort of to the lo-fi nature of the whole thing. Um, we are sending it to uh, an instance of replica. This is what's on my delay bus, uh, which is ba a really basic patch from replica, just a dotted eighth note um, with a tiny bit of offset on the left and the right. And um, we have uh, this fake stereo trick where we're delaying one side of the whole thing by uh, uh, eight milliseconds so that we can push the stereo field out from a mono thing. So before, after. This lo-fi piano thing um, was uh, a really nice sample I found on op1.fun. We are running it through an instance of audio damage EOS, which is a beautiful reverb. I really like that piano sample. It's so cool that it has all that background noise. Um, and then depending on where it is in the track, we are uh, side chaining it. Um, let's see. Doot, doot. Oh, no, I guess we got rid of the part that was side chained. That's cool. All right, filter horns. This is where the track sort of like funk comes from. Um, I probably gonna revisit this method of filtering things in the OP1. So basically in the OP1, you can, um, drop a thing called nitro on the track, which is one of the effects you can choose from. And it's a two, it's a, it's a low pass filter and a high pass filter with resonance controls for both. And um, there is a control on it to sort of create this instant envelope modulation so that depending on how many, uh, how much volume is passing through it, it will open or affect the filters in a certain way. Um, but you can also go to the LFO on the OP-1 and um, send the envelope that you've created for the amplitude to uh, one of the filters cutoffs. So you can get these really warbly sort of uh, cool filtery um, sounds. May uh, go over here. So we're, we're side chaining them. Um, I don't know why again, this, I think I tried to like do some uh, some extra filter modulation and decided at the end not to. So we just have this auto filter being dumb here. Um, and then each filter is just getting um, a little supercharge down here on this cool little, we got this little solo here, which I think is fun. Anyway, so these horns are uh, where we've got them like playing hard left and hard right. So we get just some, some stank in the background. You can see there's a lot of chopping going on and that's because I basically rewrote uh, the chord progression for the beginning in this section because I, I wanted it to sort of hit a little bit differently.
that's what it sounds like coming out of the OP-1. And here's what it sounds like with Chris Lorge Algae's guitar. You can see that we've taken the bass and the treble way down, um, added a reverb, added a little bit of delay, and it's getting widened by this pitch thing. I originally was gonna try to use guitar rig on top of it, but it was just too aggro, way too aggro. So that's nice and in the background, but still solo-y, you know? About halfway through the track, I got bored and discovered that I uh, one of the sequences that I had in the OP-1 sounded good with these chops. They ended up being in the same pitch as the track. Um, well, no, they didn't. <laughs> they were actually a departure from the main uh, section, but um, I was desperate for something to do, and uh, this just spoke to me. So I threw them in there. So um, we get this this intro of the chops is sort of like just kind of weird. You can hear it just triggering it on sixteenth notes basically, and then later we get. So it's basically each chop was like a piano chord plus these birds in the background. It was really really cool. Uh, you should definitely be if you have an OP1, you should definitely be checking OP1.fun. It's just like tons of inspiration. Um, so in context, real quick. I love this section of the song. It's one of my favorites. I should have just focused on this. Um, so this here is to de-click these chops because they had a, a pretty nasty click. Not clicking. It's too much. So this brings that clicking down a bit. It also introduces a shit ton of latency to the track. Uh, it's even if you like freeze the track with this on it, the time between hitting play and when the track actually starts playing with this kind of processor on uh, is crazy. That is all of lay instruments and stuff for this track. Uh, I hope this has been interesting to you. Um, and now you know like what happens behind the scenes when um, when I make an OP1 track. So that is uh, my city from the OP1 to Ableton. Uh, thank you for watching. My name is Jeremy. This is Red Means Recording, and I hope you have a wonderful month.